Hello, and welcome to You and Your Brain. I'm Sandy Gleistein um, with the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, or WAM, as we call it for short, a nonprofit organization founded by Maria Shriver and dedicated to answering the question of why two out of three brains that develop Alzheimer's belong to women. Amazingly, scientists don't have the answer to that yet, but we at WAM are determined to help them find it by funding women-based Alzheimer's research. You may have noted when you um, registered that this is the first in a series of conversations uh, being brought to you this month by a partnership of three leading organizations that are dedicated to women's health and well-being. Uh, WAM is so proud to be collaborating uh, with our partners, Prevention Magazine and Healthy Women, to bring you this series on brain health in the month of June. And why June? Because June is Brain Health Awareness Month. Brain health is a relatively new but very exciting concept um, for most of us. Uh, we all were raised to believe that we had a certain number of brain cells and as we aged, they died. That was it. Very little you could do to influence your um, sort of long-term cognitive health. Well, that's wrong. It turns out that the brain is magnificently capable of responding to what we do and how we treat it, um, including delaying and preventing a lot of Alzheimer's, um, which is the um, second most dreaded disease in this country after cancer. It's the leading, the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Six million people right now, just over, are diagnosed with this disease. Um, it robs people of their memories um, and over time of the essence of who they are. It's incurable. It's very difficult to be a caregiver, um, both financially and just in terms of the stress involved for someone with Alzheimer's. But for our discussion today, we're focused on um, the fact that uh, Alzheimer's disproportionately uh, impacts women and communities of color. So what we're here to do today is to make sure that we get a lot of good information um, from amazing people, uh, experts, um, on how to keep our brains healthy and free of um, Alzheimer's and other pathological brain diseases. Um, we are honored um, to have as our moderator, Dr. Tara Narula, a board certified cardiologist at Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, and an assistant professor of cardiovascular medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. She also serves as the associate director of the Women's Cardiovascular Disease Center at Lenox Hill Hospital. I met Tara when I was in New York working at CBS this morning, and she was then and remains um, the medical correspondent, not just for that show, but also for all the CBS News um, platforms. So on behalf of Prevention, uh, Healthy Women, and WHAM, um, I want to thank all of you for joining us, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Narula for being here with us, and I turn it over to her now to introduce our three incredibly distinguished panelists. Hi. Hi, thank you so much, Sandy. And thank you to all three organizations for putting together a panel on this important topic. It is the first of a three-part series of webinars this month that will be packed with valuable information. It seems particularly relevant today of all days to be discussing brain health and Alzheimer's prevention, as we are hearing so much about yesterday's FDA news-making decision to give approval to the first drug in almost 20 years for Alzheimer's, aducanumab. We'll get into that in a little bit, but first let me introduce our three incredibly distinguished panelists. I'm not able to list all of their accomplishments because there are so many, but here are a few highlights, and I think you'll understand why their voices are particularly important to hear in connection to a discussion on the aging brain, what's normal and what's not. So first, I would like to introduce Dr. Gayatri Devi. She's a super doctor, a nationally recognized expert in neurodegenerative disorders and the only American physician board certified in neurology, pain medicine, psychiatry, brain injury medicine, and behavioral neurology. She has pioneered research into memory loss and treatment. Dr. Devi also served as distinguished visiting professor at Weill Cornell Medical College is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Neurology. She served on the faculty at Columbia University, NYU, and Downstate for over 25 years, and is a go-to expert for media around the world. 
Thanks for joining us, Dr. Debbie. And now I wanna bring in Dr. Jessica Caldwell, who joins us today from Las Vegas, where she is a neuropsychologist at the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health, Cleveland Clinic, Nevada, and director of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Prevention Center at Cleveland Clinic. She currently holds a primary academic appointment as assistant professor of medicine at Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, Case Western Reserve University in the departments of neurology and in the department of neurosciences. Her clinical neuropsychology work focuses on assessing women at risk for dementia and adults and geriatric patients with concerns for memory loss. Dr. Caldwell's primary research focus is on sex differences in Alzheimer's disease biomarkers which is of tremendous value to us today in our discussion. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Dr. Esiosa Igadaro is a native of Kentucky who has the unusual distinction of holding two degrees, a medical degree as well as a PhD from the University of Kentucky College of Medicine, where she was the first African-American female to complete the MD-PhD program. During her training, she's published over 20 articles in the areas of dementia, cerebrovascular disease, and health disparities in African Americans. She's currently a neurology resident and a neuroscientist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Her research interests focus on understanding the role of racism in neurological health disparities and risk factors for cerebral small vessel disease. So again, welcome to all three of you, and let's just dive right in. So to start off, we're gonna focus a little bit on normal versus non-normal aging. And I wanna start with you, Dr. Debbie. You know, everyone fears memory loss and they think it must be a precursor to Alzheimer's. So how do we go about reassuring people that some of the cognitive signs of an aging brain are actually normal and then help them identify the ones which they should really be taking note of and talking to their doctor about? I, first of all, I wanna say that forgetting is absolutely normal and very important for us to remember and grow. If we didn't forget our first kiss, it would be hard for us to fall in love again. So forgetting is very important. So it's important to realize that daily forgetting of most of the things that we are exposed to, particularly as we grow older, people in our 20s and our 30s, as we get older, we're going to forget more and that's perfectly normal. One of the things that patients often complain about and are very worried about is forgetting of names. And we are exposed to so many people in our lifetimes now as compared to our ancestors. We're required to remember more names than ever before. So forgetting names is not abnormal as we get older. However, if the forgetting begins to affect our ability to function, if we find that we're forgetting on a daily basis, things that most of us would remember, or what we used to remember, then it may be time to pause and figure out what the cause may be. It may just be something very simple like lack of sleep. But if it continues to progress and it is not getting better, then it's a good time to see your internist, talk to them about what's going on. And it could be something very simple. It could just be a hormone problem. It could be something like an infection in the Northeast Lyme disease can sometimes cause this problem. So first, see if it's a progressive problem. Most of the time, it's completely normal for us to forget. And it's completely good for us to forget. And it's important for our brain to grow in order, um, in order for us to remember better. That was great information. And I just want to follow up real quickly by asking, are there actually specific areas of the brain, Dr. Debbie, that inevitably do deteriorate? So, Really, starting in our 20s, our brains start to lose brain cells every single day. Um, and every decade of our life, we lose about 5% of our brain cells. And that's normal because it allows us to prune our brain. Imagine that our brain gets pruned as we get older so that it's better able to function better. However, there are certain parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, which is a tiny, tiny area of the brain about the size of my little finger on both sides of my brain. And the hippocampus is kind of a clearing house, both for the retrieval of memory and for the laying down of certain kinds of memory um, that is most often called declarative memory, the kind of memory that you get tested on in exams, the kind of memory that's important for name recall. And that area uh, tends to also atrophy as we get older. 
Um, but just because an area of the brain shrinks doesn't necessarily mean that its function is affected. So sometimes patients will say, oh my God, my brain has shrunk on my MRI or my neuroimaging. Does that mean that I have a problem? And the answer is not always and not, not often. Many times atrophy is completely normal and expected as we get older. Thank you so much. And I wanna to move to you, Dr. Caldwell. You know, as a neuropsychologist, what are the changes in behavior that people might either notice in themselves or in loved ones that could indicate a larger problem? And if in fact it turns out that these changes point to Alzheimer's or dementia, how do you then help someone through what is definitely a fearful experience for so many and begin that conversation about the next steps? Such a great question. So like Dr. Debbie was saying, there are many types of brain changes and forgetting that are totally normal as we age. What I'm going to mention is some examples of things that might indicate that there is a problem going on that needs to be acted on, whether it's in yourself or a loved one. And I'm talking about changes in day-to-day -day tasks like driving, cooking, and managing your medications and finances. So an example of what might be normal with aging in something like driving is backing off from nighttime driving or backing off from freeway driving. Those things are very reasonable um, responses to aging and reduced reaction time that naturally comes with aging. On the other hand, what could indicate a problem is if you notice that your loved one's car has unexplained scratches and dents in the bumpers that could suggest driving is becoming unsafe. When it comes to something like cooking, any of us can forget an ingredient in a recipe, even if it's one that we've made many, many times before. That probably doesn't indicate a problem. On the other hand, if the reason that the recipe didn't turn out is because that you or your loved one forgot it in the oven, forgot that you were cooking and burned it completely, that could indicate a big change is happening. Similarly with medications and finances, a single episode of forgetting a bill or a pill isn't what you're looking for for a problem. It's more a consistent pattern over time of forgetting or confusion about how to get something done. If you are noticing those kind of changes, particularly in a loved one, it can be really fear generating to think about, well, what is this? What do I do? How do I talk to someone about this? And when I work with families, what I encourage people to do is to be as honest as you can about what you're seeing and to have that conversation as early as possible. The reason is really because of what fear is made of, what the building blocks of fear are. And some of those are, there's a threat present, there's something that you don't know coming up in the future, and there's something you can't control. And if there's potentially a memory problem or Alzheimer's disease coming on, that threat is still there. You still don't have an answer, but having a conversation can help you as well as your loved one take back control, both in terms of getting an assessment and then in terms of putting together safety guards for the future. Thank you so much, such great information. Dr. Gadero. I wanna talk a little bit about your specific line of work. As a physician, you've studied many forms of dementia. How is Alzheimer's different from other forms of dementia? And are they all fatal or are there ways to treat them differently based on which type you have? Thank you, thank you for that great question. It's a question that I've gotten often as I'm seeing patients in the clinic and as I'm talking about dementia in the outpatient setting. So first let's take a step back and let's talk about what the definition of dementia is. And as Dr. Cadwell talked about is dementia is basically when you have multiple domains of your cognition affected. If you're not being able to perform activities of daily living, such as being able to manage your checkbook like you used to, or being able to cook, clean, drive, remember um, recipes. If you're having multiple domains of your cognition affected, then we start to say, okay, is this a malcognitive impairment or is this leading into what we call dementia? So dementia is a clinical syndrome. And then as patients come into the, into the clinical setting, we take this information and then we categorize, is this normal aging? Is this malcognitive impairment? 
or is this dementia? So if we say, okay, based upon the symptoms that you're telling me, based upon what the caregiver is noticing, based upon what family members and what the patient tells us, we, we can best be able to put patients in one of those clinical syndromes. And if we put a patient in the clinical syndrome dementia, then the next question we ask ourselves is, well, what's causing this dementia? What is leading up to this dementia process? And one of the very interesting things as a um, neurology resident and also a neuroscientist is that there are so many different pathologies that cause the clinical syndrome of dementia. Alzheimer's disease being one of the major etiologies, but it's not the only. And then the four years I spent in my PhD work with Dr. Peter Nelson at the Alzheimer's Disease Center at the University of Kentucky, we, in those four years, there were three or four new pathologies that were characterized and published that, that basically present similarly to Alzheimer's disease clinically, but when you're able to get a piece of um, the specimen from the brain and you look at it underneath the microscope, you don't see the characteristic plaques and tangles as you do in Alzheimer's disease, because that's the definition of Alzheimer's disease is plaques and tangles in the brain, you see other etiologies, whether it's TDP43 or other different protein accumulations that can lead to near degeneration causing the clinical syndrome of dementia. And the reason why it's really important to understand what is the etiology of one's dementia, because then that will allow us to provide accurate treatments. Because if your dementia is due to Alzheimer's versus um, dementia with Lewy body, the treatments are different. Or if it's due to more of a vascular dementia, the treatments are different. So it's really important for us as clinicians and scientists to understand what's causing your dementia so that we can provide the necessary treatments as needed. And I know we'll get into this later on, but one of the fascinating things about being able to tease out different etiologies is being able to come up with phenomenal treatments that could help. And one treatment that just came out recently, we'll talk about it later, is groundbreaking. So that's the importance of knowing what dementia is. It's a clinical syndrome and knowing that there are numerous causes of dementia, Alzheimer's disease being the major one. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing up um, the, what we mentioned earlier, which was the breaking news today. And I'd love to get some of your input around the new drug, Adahelm, that was approved by the FDA, really the first one in many, many years that works very differently from the current drugs that are available. So is this drug, in your opinion, a, a game changer? Or what, what are your thoughts around this? It is a game changer. It is one of the few, one of the most recent drugs that have come out in the last 20 years that we can now give another option for patients that are having dementia and dementia due to probable Alzheimer's disease. So in the field of behavioral science, it's, it's revolutionary. And I'm really excited as a young clinician to be able to understand more about this drug and about this medication and, and see how it can help patients who come to clinic and who are who are undergoing a very debilitating disease and they're looking to us to say, doctor, what what's out there for me? And now we can say, we have another tool that we can give you to help decrease or slow down the disease progression. So I'm extremely excited and I think it's a huge game changer and I'm looking forward to how um, it plays out with our patients. I'm curious about your thoughts, uh, Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Devi. So sure. I personally think that it's, um, I agree with Dr. Igadaro. I think it's a fantastic new drug in our armamentarium for treating Alzheimer's disease. There's been a lot of controversy in terms of the approval because um, of the two studies, one study showed that it helped and the other study, study did not show any clinical benefit. Uh, but my, in my opinion, um, everybody with Alzheimer's has their own private type of Alzheimer's because we each have our own unique brains. And in addition to the pathology of the plaques and the tangles that are present in Alzheimer's disease, 95% of patients with Alzheimer's will have some kind of vascular pathology in their brain. 
They may have about, a, about 30 to 40% have some level of Lewy body uh, related pathology in their brain. And we each bring our own brains to the process. So when you have a drug like aticanumab, which dissolves the plaques in the brain, one of the two patho pathological substances that are thought to be present um, and responsible for causing Alzheimer's, it is truly revolutionary. And it's not surprising that if you lump all patients with Alzheimer's together into one basket, that the results may be inconsistent. Um, so I think the pathological reduction of plaques was present in both studies and that's revolutionary. And in conjunction with other treatment modalities, this drug will surely benefit a significant proportion of patients with Alzheimer's, in my opinion. I just wanted to, to add as well that, you know, this drug, the reason why it's different and why it's so exciting, as uh, Dr. Devi and Dr. Igadero are touching on, is that it modifies the disease. This is the first approved drug that actually changes what's happening in Alzheimer's pathology. Other drugs that we've had back approved 20 years and before ago are changing, affecting the symptoms. So they're basically supporting your memory in a different way that doesn't change the underlying disease pathology. So this is the first time we're actually looking at a change. But at the same time, this drug is not a cure for the disease and it's not a reason to not focus on healthy lifestyle and prevention behaviors early on. In order to really attack Alzheimer's disease, we are going to need both approaches, continued development of these types of medications, as well as continued focus on prevention. Thank you all so much. Um, obviously, so many interested in your opinions, so we appreciate that um, because there was so much controversy around this, so thank you. I want to move now to the topic of genetics, gender, and ethnicity, and how that plays into Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Devi, I want to start with you. How much do genetics actually determine someone's risk for developing Alzheimer's and other dementias? We've had so many people write to us asking about their concerns, watching their own parents or grandparents develop Alzheimer's, and expressing fear that they may be at risk as well because of their genes. Should they be concerned? Genetics, in my opinion, is not your destiny. Just because you have a parent with Alzheimer's, it does not mean that you are destined to get it. Uh, I will have patients say, you know, my grand, my mom behaves exactly like me. She looks exactly like me. Therefore, I too am going to get this condition. There are two major kinds of Alzheimer's. There's early onset Alzheimer's, which is Alzheimer's that occurs in a person before the age of 65, where the symptoms develop before that age, and late onset Alzheimer's, which is Alzheimer's that begins after that age. Late onset Alzheimer's is by far the most common kind. 95% of us, when we develop Alzheimer's, are going to get late onset Alzheimer's. Only 5% or less will have early onset. Early onset Alzheimer's is very inheritable. So 50% of the children of patients with early onset Alzheimer's will develop it. Late onset Alzheimer's is very much what's called a multifactorial condition. In other words, environment, lifestyle, how much you sleep, what you eat, your cardiovascular risk factors, all joined together, together to modify risk for late onset Alzheimer's so you can have a pair of identical twins, in other words, identical genetics, and one person can get late onset Alzheimer's and the other doesn't get it for another 17 years or more, which is huge because if you get it when you're 95, it's very different from getting it when you are 78. So, in a, so therefore, late onset Alzheimer's, which is the most common type of Alzheimer's disease, is very between 40 to 60 percent of cases of late onset Alzheimer's disease, the symptoms can be prevented or um, they, they can be delayed so that they appear later in life uh, by just simple changes in your lifestyle in terms of uh, modifications that we'll discuss later. So genetics is not your de destiny as far as Alzheimer's is concerned. And in my experience, when there is a family member with Alzheimer's disease, late onset Alzheimer's particularly, I find that the children are at lower risk because they come in to seek treatment earlier. 
they're more likely to embrace lifestyle modifications and they may end up at lower risk than the general population. Well, I definitely talk a lot about lifestyle in my practice and the importance of that. So we cannot underestimate the those risk factors and how we have the ability to control our destiny based on the choices that we make. Dr. Caldwell, I'm curious about the gender disparity that we see, you know, twice as many women as men develop Alzheimer's. Why? There, it, that's a great question. And I think the unfortunate answer is we don't entirely have an answer to that question. Um, we do know a lot at this point from the research literature and some of it relates to our genetics and some of it relates to our environment. And when I say genetics, just as one example, there is evidence that women who have the, a copy of the most common late onset Alzheimer's disease risk gene, the APOE4 allele, that a woman with that allele has greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease later than a man does having the same exact risk gene. But at the same time, I do want to emphasize that that gene, I totally agree with Dr. Devi, it's not your destiny, it's just a risk factor. But in addition to those genetics, we also have environmental risks, like the lifestyle modifications we're talking about. Part of our environment though, is actually determined by our gender. And when I say gender, what I mean is the way that the world sees us as women versus as men. And when the world sees us as women, it gives certain things to us and it takes certain things away. And some of those things are not great for us in terms of Alzheimer's disease or brain health risks. As just two examples, women who are currently being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, that generation had something potentially taken away more frequently than from men. And that's educational opportunities. We know that people who finish high school have less rates of Alzheimer's disease when they age. And we also know that attending college helps people to build cognitive reserve or brain resilience, which can help you to delay symptoms when uh, brain pathology does begin to, to build up. Another thing that, that might be relevant to our gender that the world gives us as women that might not be so good is that women experience certain types of stress more frequently than men do. And when those stressors become chronic, it can be a, a situation that gives negative impact to the brain's hippocampus, that region that's important for memory formation and that is impacted early in Alzheimer's disease. So as a woman, we can have genetic risks, we can also have environmental or gender specific risks, and these things really do come together to potentially explain why we have higher rates of Alzheimer's than men's. Thank you so much. And I want to move a little bit away from gender and towards ethnicity and racial background. Uh, Dr. Gadero, according to the Alzheimer's Association, people of color are at higher risk of developing Alzheimer's. In fact, twice as likely if you're African American and one and a half times as likely if you're of Latin heritage. But you say that those statistics might not reflect what's really going on and that what we're seeing is another example of health disparities and the effects of institutional racism at work. Can you explain that and what you believe to lie at the root cause of the very high incidence of dementia within communities of color? Exactly, thank you. Thank you for that question. So as you mentioned, statistics, there's been published papers to talk about um, the risk of African-Americans and under underserved populations having higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So keep that in mind. And so I keep, here are two facts I want you to keep in mind. The first fact that we just talked about, and then the second fact is the GOAT standard for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease is neuropathology. And that the GOAT standard is in order to definitively say with 100% certainty that you have Alzheimer's disease is for us to do a brain biopsy, to stain and to look for amyloid plaques and tangles. Again, so African-Americans have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease, but the gold standard for Alzheimer's disease is brain biopsy. So keep those two facts in mind. Now, there are numerous papers that have been published that talk about the historical mistrust of African-Americans and other underserved populations when it comes to participating in clinical studies and in clinical trials. 
And there's many reasons as to why that historical mistrust exists. And I've actually published a paper discussing that historical mistrust. So if you want more information, you can look up Igadara and all 2017, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And because of this historical mistrust and mistreatment, African-Americans are less likely to participate in clinical trials and clinical studies. So in order to get that data, if African-Americans are not participating in clinical trials and clinical studies, and if Alzheimer's disease, we need brain biopsy to definitively say that you have Alzheimer's disease, then where is the statistic coming from? So from that standpoint, that's why I am skeptical about do is it true is it really true that african americans have higher rates of alzheimer's disease if the gold standard for diagnosing alzheimer's disease is neuropathology and african americans have low rates of recruitment and retention in such studies so that's the one issue that i like to raise regarding these statistics the second issue so if we if we agree okay we enrolled a handful of African Americans, we've compared the rates of Alzheimer's disease to white Americans and other groups, and it still holds true that African Americans do in fact have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease. Well, then why? Why is that? And many of the papers up until recently, um, one leading hypothesis has been genetics, that there is a genetic predisposition for African Americans to have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease. And I think as we now learn from um, social science research and social determinants of health. And as Dr. Codwell brought up that there are, our environment plays a role in our risk for developing neurodegenerative diseases. And as um, and to me, one of those risks outside of socioeconomic status, outside of insurance or where you live, another part, an unfortunate part is racism. And there are individuals who have who experienced racism more so than other individuals. And racism is a stress response. And we know that stress is not good for the body. So could it be that chronic systemic racism over a lifetime, whether it's individual or systemic or structural, could that also play a role in African-Americans risk for developing or being more predisposed to neurodegenerative processes such as Alzheimer's disease? So that's one of the research interests that I'm interested in and currently developing studies to try and understand what is the biological mechanism as to which chronic perceived racism is playing a role in our in our health. I want to move a little bit towards a positive, hopeful subject, which is prevention. Dr. Devi, it's, it's exciting to think that a new era is actually upon us and we might be able to do things that are proactive for our brain health. You've written a lot about brain and cognitive issues that develop during menopause and you're concerned that women really stress out and fear them. What is your suggestion for how women can prepare themselves for menopause and the changes that might await them? Um, I have three words, two words, consider hormones. Um, so women going, starting in their 40s, going into their 50s, go through menopause, uh, when they're, when basically that's when their period stops. Um, and the period for about, for, and the time of about seven years around the cessation of your menses is associated with significant cognitive changes. You could have trouble with your short-term memory. You could have trouble finding words. You can have trouble with multitasking you can have trouble with your mood. Um, and all of this is not helped by having night sweats, having trouble sleeping, waking up drenched in your own sweat, um, having to deal with your children who may be growing up and your teenagers, as well as your aging parents who may or may not have some kind of dementia, which just makes you feel much worse because you think, oh my God, am I also getting the same condition? Um, so menopause related, cognitive impairment is a real condition which can almost mimic early onset Alzheimer's disease. And I've written about it and was published in the Journal of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology as an important condition that needs to be recognized in women 
as they go through the menopausal transition because it can be misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. And I've had that happen in a few of my patients um, because oftentimes at memory disorder centers, um, the neurologists or the geriatricians may not inquire into a woman's menopausal history. They may not realize that she has, she's going through menopause and that's why she's having these memory problems. The reason I got into the field myself is because I made that same mistake. I diagnosed a patient with Alzheimer's disease who was in her mid fifties and uh, she came back a year later and she said, listen, doc, I'm all better. And I said, how's that even possible? You can't get better. You can't be cured from a condition like Alzheimer's. Well, it turns out that she was put on a hormone because she was going through menopause and that cured her of all the symptoms, which looked exactly like she had Alzheimer's. So having said that, I think there's good news for women going through menopause. Consider hormones during the menopausal transition. If you're having any of the symptoms of night sweats, hot flashes, about 60% of women going through menopause will experience cognitive symptoms. Um, and this is verifiable by doing objective testing. And you may speak to your gynecologist about whether or not you're a candidate for hormones. You may not be because you're afraid of hormones. You're worried about breast cancer risk. And those are things to bring up with your gynecologist. Alternatively, there are other treatments that you can use that can help you through the menopausal transition. I have one patient who saw me recently for memory problems related to her menopause. She just could not sleep and she couldn't go on hormones because she had a family history of breast cancer and she was afraid to go on them. And we picked out a medication that would help her sleep and help her with her hot flashes that was not a hormonal medication and that ended up helping her with her memory. So that's a positive thing to do for women going through menopause to understand, first of all, there is that condition which will reduce your stress level because you don't have to worry about something like Alzheimer's um, if, you're, if you are having symptoms very similar to it. And also that there's treatment available for treating, for, for su treating such symptoms. Such important information and something I think so many women aren't really aware of. Um, Dr. Caldwell, you in fact run the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Prevention Center at Cleveland Clinic. This is a center predicated on women at risk being able to really reduce or eliminate their risk for Alzheimer's. What are the realities of being able to do that and who is best positioned to do so? So in essence, what is a woman's best ammunition in the fight to reduce her risk for Alzheimer's? Thank you for asking about this. So we know from the research that about 40% of current Alzheimer's disease cases are thought to have been preventable if folks had modified their lifestyle. And when I say lifestyle, I mean everything from not smoking, moderating drinking, not having or adequately treating diabetes and hypertension and addressing depression. So when I see women in clinic, that's what I'm aiming at. We're working at modifying, reducing, treating these factors that are, have been identified as modifiable risks for Alzheimer's. We do also help women to work on uh, factors that are associated with better or worse brain health with aging, regardless of Alzheimer's disease risk. So here we're talking about things like sleep, for example, and stress. And with these modifications, we are aiming at that 40% and giving women tools and hope to reduce those risk factors they can. We can't guarantee prevention of Alzheimer's disease, but our hope and our intent is to help women prevent it if they can and or delay it. Um, like we mentioned earlier, being able to delay symptom onset by 10 or 15 years could be incredibly meaningful for someone's life. In terms of who is the best candidate for prevention uh, lifestyle change, our clinic is designed for women who are in their 30s through their end of their 50s. And the reason that we pick this range is this is when we can really do the most work on actually preventing those Alzheimer's disease related changes from starting in the brain. We know that those plaques and tangles are starting to appear 15 or even 20 years before someone starts to have memory problems. 
And so if the average age of memory problem onset is in the 70s, that means we're looking back toward age 60 or even 55, where we want to really prevent. And so we ask women to come in when they're younger, but that's not to say that living a brain healthy lifestyle when you're younger than 30 or older than 60, or even if you have cognitive impairments like mild cognitive impairment isn't helpful. We know that there are some things that you can do even in your 20s that might have incredible benefit for aging healthily in terms of your brain. One of those is regular exercise. And we also know that there are things that you can do after 60 or if you have a cognitive impairment that can really meaningfully impact your day-to-day -day life or even your cognitive concerns. When women ask me about their, you know, what's the best thing that they can do? Where do you start? I think something that they don't expect to hear is that I tell them you have to prioritize yourself. That's your best ammo. You have to start with you and making these changes for yourself. Beyond that, there are so many things that women um, can do for themselves. And I'll just mention two categories of things that a woman could start with today. One of those is focusing on your habits. So I'm talking about quitting smoking, moderating the drinking, and really being engaged both uh, cognitively and physically in life. And the other area is really paying attention to your social and emotional health. So don't ignore depression if it's there. Uh, watch those stress levels, stay connected to your social network. Thank you so much. And I love the idea of prioritizing your health as a woman. Again, it's something we talk about so much in the world of cardiovascular disease. And unfortunately, women have themselves low, low down on their lists and we need to help them move up to the top. Dr. Gadero, I know that you as well strongly believe that preventative measures are possible, but that we need the power of a larger societal message and understanding of, as you mentioned before, the effects of institutional racism in order to take this on. So that being said, is there a different message about prevention that you would give a white woman versus a black woman? And if we are dealing with health disparities based on racism, what is the message that you want people listening today to hear about what their options are? Phenomenal question. From an individual standpoint, I would not give a, a different message to a white woman versus a black woman. I think the message that has been said well by my previous other colleagues is to you know, prioritize your health and take care of yourself with exercise, diet, not smoking. But the, the different message that I would give to the overall society, to our hospital administrators, to policymakers, to government and officials, insurance companies, is that systemic racism is a public health crisis. And that it was taken directly from the, the director from the um, CDC. Many institutions have put out statements regarding this. So in, all, in the Alzheimer's field, I, the message I wanna send to, to people that, who are empowered to be able to make change is to really take a good look at your institution, at your governing body, your areas of influence, and try and see what some of, what strategies can you implement in order to help combat and alleviate and eliminate structural racism. And an example being, I have the um, fortune of being able to work with Dr. Isaacson, who is also got, who is also one of the phenomenal panelists that will be on in a couple of series, and he's the director of the Alzheimer's Center at Cornell, and we're working together to be able to put out information on Alzheimer's disease and on these topics in order to help disseminate this information so that as many people as possible have access to information, which helps to eliminate some of these barriers to, to healthcare. Another thing that my team is doing is writing papers on this topic and basically writing call to action. I was able to get one of my pieces published in the Nature Journal this year that talked about how we need to focus on how can we as a system eliminate structural racism so that we can help decrease and hopefully eliminate the health disparities that exist in Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and other neurological conditions. Great, thank you so much. And as we sort of 
round up this wonderful panel, I want to leave our audience with some useful quick tips. So we received dozens of questions from today's audience asking what the most important beneficial things are that they can do for brain health and also asking what are some of the most damaging behaviors that they should avoid. So in a quick round robin, I'd love for each of you to give me your best and worst uh, tips for our audience. So maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Debbie. Um, so my three tips would be, first of all, exercise. If you can do aerobic exercise for 45 minutes, three times a week, it actually grows new brain cells in your hippocampus. It, that's amazing, but not only that, it also increases dendritic sprouting and richer neural networks so that your brain is a thicker forest of, of lusher nerve cells, which makes for a better working brain. So if you can, please exercise aerobically at least 45 minutes, three times a week. And if not, maybe just take a walk around the block. That's just as good, not just as good, but helpful. Number two, eat right. And that's very hard to do. People often will say to me, well, what's good for the brain? What kind of food is good for the brain? And I always say, any kind of food that's good for your heart is also going to be good for your brain. And my tips with eating right are, first of all, cut out refined carbohydrates. And I know that's very hard to do, but refined carbohydrates, which includes all, like, all the things that I love, pasta, sugar, desserts, pastries, croissants, all those things um, will spike the insulin level in your body and that eventually creates insulin resistance, which is not good for your brain. Aside from which it also creates a metabolic syndrome, which can cause problems with other areas, including cardiovascular health, which is then makes it harder for good brain health. So if you are somebody who likes great things like croissants, then what you want to do is you first preload with a little bit of protein. So then the protein and followed by some carbs will then reduce the insulin spike. But if you are going to have an insulin spike, it isn't so, so dramatic. And it also keeps you fuller longer. So refined carbohydrates, if you can cut that out, that's very helpful for, um, for uh, good eating habits. And the second thing, of course, is to reduce your fat intake. So try not to have that much fat. Finally, and the funnest part, the best piece of advice I have to give is to sleep. Sleeping is unbelievably helpful for your memory. First of all, it reduces sleep, it reduces stress. It also promotes the laying down of new memories so that when they've woken up or they've recorded um, birds at night, they find the birds rehearse their bird song and they will alter their bird song just a little bit based on what they are hearing in their sleep to make it sound better the next day. So every night we rehearse the memories of our day and it allows us to be more learned, if you will, the next day. In addition to which, during sleep, there's a certain system called the glymphatic system, which is like the brain sanitation system, and that removes the plaques in your brain and shunts it away so that it can be excreted. So sleep is very important. People will often say to me, well, how can I sleep better? Do I need to take sleeping pills? The best sleep is good old fashioned, unmedicated, just tired sleep. The problem is we've all learned to unprioritize sleep. We think of sleep as this kind of large time bank from which we can withdraw and use it for partying, use it for studying, use it for all other things. But sleep in and of itself is conserved across species. And the reason it is, is because it's very, very important for the brain. Birds do it, bees do it, and we should be doing a lot more sleeping to help our memory. Thank you. Dr. Caldwell, can you enlighten us with some of your tips? Sure. So the three things I would hope women could take away are to learn, to connect, and to use techniques to manage stress. When I say learn, what I'm talking about is cognitive challenge. Keep learning, keep engaging in things that make you really work. So don't let yourself go through your day on autopilot, particularly if you've retired and you're not getting a challenge from your work life anymore. Find ways to keep your brain learning and engaged. Connect. C 
see your friends. If you can't see your friends over this past year has been a great example of how to be flexible about staying connected to your network. Talk, pick up the phone, have a Zoom call, uh, try to join in on other calls where you might meet new people or just get that social interaction even if you're not making friendships. And then finally with stress, particularly working with women at midlife, there's a lot going on. Many folks will have menopause issues, people are having babies, having young children, they might be taking care of parents with Alzheimer's disease, they might be also working at the same time. We're not going to tell people to reduce your stress because you might not really be able to do that. But what you might be able to do is put some techniques in place in your life that can modify the impact of all that stress on your brain. And one of the best ones that we recommend is mindfulness meditation even just several minutes per day, just building a habit to help you disengage from stressors that might be things that are here for, for years, especially at midlife. Well, I love mindfulness. I actually teach my children and we, we use an app on our phone. It's so easy these days to be able to incorporate that into your daily routine. Um, I wanna end with you, Dr. Gadero. Uh, give us some of your tips. Thank you. Some of my um, biggest tips would be to manage other underlying conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, some of these medical conditions that we talked about previously, all of these are risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So being taking control of these conditions will help promote better brain health. And another tip I have is to reach out to your provider, reach out to your care team. There are many products out there, many expensive products that claim if you take this new supplement or if you do, if you buy this um, app or if you play with this neuroscience app five times a week, it will help to decrease Alzheimer's disease. And the thing that sometimes is really heartbreaking is that I know that I know patients who have little means who spend their money on these predatorial products that make these false claims that do not have any evidence-based information to support these claims. So if you ever have a question about, doc, should I buy this supplement or should I enroll in this program or should I take part in this app? Please talk to us, please ask us because the last thing that we want is for our patients to feel the burden of having to buy these products that may not work. And the things that we have proposed are all free. Exercise, walking, eating right, being social. Those are things that have shown to help and they are free. So please reach out to us. We're here to help. And together we can help prevent Alzheimer's disease. Well, thank you so much. You all were so incredibly amazing uh, and brought us so much wisdom and perspective. We thank you. You gave us such great tips. And um, I also want to thank the organizers of today's event, Prevention and Healthy Women magazines and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. And I finally want to thank the over 1,500 participants who signed up to join us today. We hope that you've taken something away from today's conversation that will lead you further in your own journey to brain health. And finally, a quick reminder to visit our website, yourbrain2021.com, to make sure and register for the next two conversations that are taking place on June 15th and June 22nd. One, on how to move forward when you or a loved one is given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, and the other on what the future of brain health research looks like. You won't wanna miss either. So again, my thanks to our wonderful panelists and to the participants who joined us here today. Goodbye, everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.